you're new to Waterstone, here we are in a series called Thy Kingdom. Let me explain and remind all of us why we're in this. It's a, it's a 20 plus sermon, sermon series, and it's designed to take a walk through the Word of God to show us the kingdom authority we have in this world. Now, we know we live in a fallen world. We know we live in a dark world. We know this is sort of augmented reality. And although we wake up in this world, we often interpret this reality as reality, when in reality it's not. Like we wake up with physical feet on this earth and with all of our emotions, all of our intentions, all of our obligations, all of our studies and family and investments and everything we have. Like we are so fully invested and immersed in this world that it doesn't take long to shift perspective from the heavenly to the earthly. But as a follower of Christ, the moment you come to faith in Christ, now what does that mean? It means you confess faith in Christ. You know that you were not meant for this life. You know that you, there's, you were made for something else, but you realize there's something standing between you and God, and, and that is the sin that's in your life, and you confess faith in Christ. And you ask him to cleanse you and to forgive you and to save you and to help you every day after that decision to walk with him. The moment you and I have confessed faith in Christ, we, not, we are now seated in the heavenlies. So although we wake up in the earthlies, everything about our earthly walk should be engineered by the heavenly perspective. Everything. The Bible says take captive every thought. So this is so much more than your 401k. It's so much more than your job. It's so much more than where you're going to go for lunch today. It's literally every thought. Why? Because thoughts are coming at you from this earthly perspective that want to augment your reality, that want to cause you to get off step. And sometimes it's just the one thought that gets you five degrees off. Well, let me remind you, five degrees off over three miles is significantly off. And before you know it, you wake up and you're bewildered spiritually bewildered emotionally and you're like how did I get to this place and if you don't ever wake up to that sometimes you begin to rationalize the space that you're in well everybody else is doing it well it's not really hurting me or it's not hurting others now I want to go ahead and give you a warning right off the bat the text we're going to read this morning is going to hit every one of us and I just know right now there's, there, there's going to be some things that the text says and that I elaborate on that you're like, not so sure about that, Pastor Ron. Like, uh, yeah, you might even get that response, right? <laughs> Perfect timing, right? Like, I, I mean, I'm being serious. Like, you never know. Like, I, I, I just know. But it's going to hit all of us. Listen, every one of us in here on the same playing field, we're in need of Christ. We are desperately lost without him. None of us are sufficient on our own. And every moment of every, of every day, we need to take captive that thought to say, God, help me live my life for you. Now for those who are only wearing religious clothes but do not have a converted heart, I pray today that that veil is removed. The Bible tells us there is a veil of darkness over you. 2 Corinthians tells us that, that the, the enemy of this world has blinded this world so they cannot see what God has to offer them. And right now, I know, if you're that person, I know what you're feeling right now. You're feeling pride. Well, that's not me. I'm not, like, right now, you're feeling like, well, we're not coming back to this church. Well, who is he to tell me that? Like, all of those emotions are natural from an earthly perspective, but they are unnatural from a heavenly perspective. And I want to take the time this morning to read, read the Word of God and then do what's called deliver a sermon after that. But you know, you know me, I long to honestly just read the Word of God one day and let the Word of God do what only the Word of God can do, and that's change hearts and change lives. And I want to read Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 21. You ever going to read 21 verses? Then we're going to jump over to Romans 13. We're only going to read about three verses there. But listen, therefore, remember that word therefore? It's a link to everything he's already taught us. So the first half of Ephesians is doctrine. The last half of the book of Ephesians is duty. Here's what you do with what you've just learned. So every time he uses the word therefore, he's calling you back like snapping the fingers. Go back and remember. Go, go back and remember. Here's what we learned. Therefore, do this. Be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love. As Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not be named among you, as is proper, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, 
which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Wow. You see, we always thought it was people that really sinned really bad, right? The Bible says, wow, if you've even coveted, you don't have a place. Like, in other words, your heart needs to be cleansed. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Therefore, do not be partners with them. One more time. Therefore, do not be partners with them. One more time. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For at one time you were in darkness. That's all of us. That's all of us. At one point in our lives, all of us were duped. We were fooled. We were spiritually ignorant. We were in the dark. Don't ever forget that no matter how far you've been and how long you've been following Christ, don't ever let somebody else's sin surprise you. Because you can tell yourself, I once was that person. I may not have committed that specific sin, but my heart was dark. And because of that same darkness, they committed the sins which I committed of those sins. Walk as children, the Bible says. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern, I love that phrase, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. In other words, what he's saying is like, keep, keep working through the fog. Keep working through the fog, like keep, keep your eyes on Christ. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. You ever wonder why people say TGIF, thank God it's Friday? Because what they did on the Friday before didn't happen, so they got to keep doing it every Friday until they think that it happens, right? They just relive, thank God it's Friday, over and over like Groundhog Day of darkness. But anyway... But instead expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of these things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Here we go. This is my favorite word, and it's not specifically mentioned, but it's my favorite word in the entire Bible. I love this one word. In the King James, this word, look carefully, carefully, is the word circumspectly. Don't you just love the way that word sounds? Circumspectly. Anyway, I love it. Look carefully then, circumspectly, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. We have too many sober Christians, by the way. Uh, we have people that aren't drunk on the Spirit. They're drunk on everything else, right? Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Jump over to Romans 13, and then we're going to jump into the sermon. Verse 11, besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake up from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us than we first believed. The night is far gone. I love that phrase. The night is far gone. Meaning, as Christians, darkness is no longer who we are. That's what he means. Like, you no longer walk in that. Like, the night is gone. Like, quit living for nighttime. And quit living to do the things that people only do at nighttime, if you will. Like, in secret and in darkness. Not just AM and PM, if you will. But in those moments of darkness. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness. That's an activity. That's an activity. You have to constantly cast off the works of darkness. The thoughts of darkness or the, the works of darkness will constantly attach themselves to you through thoughts, through actions, through desires, through pleasures, uh, through intimacies, right? Anything other than Christ, it will attach itself to you and you constantly have to be casting off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I can't wait to preach that point. By the way, that is not Ephesians chapter 6. We're not there yet. I want you to notice that we're not there yet. In Ephesians chapter 6, he says, put on the armor. Sometimes you and I can put on the armor before we put on Christ and the weapons do us no good. Do you know what I mean? Like sometimes you can go to church and say, well, I did it. Sometimes you can up the Bible and say, I read it. Sometimes you can go to God in prayer and say, I read, you know, I prayed. 
Sometimes we can try to actively put on in our own energy. Sometimes we can put on what we think is, is, what, is what God requires. But before we ever get to Ephesians 6 and put on the armor, he says, you got to put on Jesus. It's Jesus. The armor doesn't save. Jesus saves. All right, come on. Amen. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision. Like don't have a pantry in your life for the flesh <laughs> to gratify his desires. Stay away from it, in other words. All right, let's work through this, all right? Three things we're going to learn this morning. Wake up, clean up, dress up. There's the sermon right there, right? Here's what we know. Here's what we know. There's an ongoing war, and it's an invisible war. That's what's so difficult about this war. Like, you and I can, can physically see now wars that are happening here in our country, uh, around the world. Like, we can see those physical wars, whether they're cultural whether they're emotional, whether they're spiritual, or whether they're actual wars. We can see them. But this spiritual war, remember, is, it's an invisible war. The Bible says we don't fight with flesh and blood. The Bible says we fight with principalities and authorities and cosmic beings. Remember, that battle that is waged between the gap of our heavenly position and our earthly walk is won by prayer, sending those back up. That's what helps fight the battle. We need to wake up. Was what he's, twice he says that, wake up and see the enemy is upon us. We need to sound the alarm, in other words. And the sad thing is the church is asleep with the covers pulled over over her head and the sanctuary is dark. Now, that's not necessarily our church. I thank God for that. That's not necessarily our church. I, and I, honestly, I thank God for that. After how many years of training over 10,000 pastors, it's sad to say that the, I see so many churches that literally are asleep. One of my favorite uh, pastors and the most quoted pastor, by the way, of all time, Vance Havner, said there is anarchy in the world, apostasy in the church, and apathy in the pew. Wow, what an indictment. I fear that too many sermons today are like bedtime stories. Or they're, they're just good cultural memoirs. Rather than reveries and God's alarm clock that's going off all around us, here's what we know. Jesus is coming like a thief in the night. And you and I have to be ready. You and I have to be ready. Confession 1001. Very few people know this one. And some of you do. When I first arrived here, there was a tremendous fog over this church like I had never experienced in all my years of ministry. And it took me two to three years to even get my head around it. I, I, it, I was so disoriented. I was like, I don't know what's happening here. And here's what I learned. Preaching the word of God is what cut through the fog of anything else in life. And what I'm witnessing around the country, and I pray never happens to us, right? And I pray, of course, never happens to me, um, being called into ministry. Here's what I'm, I'm witnessing around the country. There are pastors nowadays that really don't know how to preach the Word of God. Now, me, me, in me saying that, I'm not saying that I know how to. I'm praying that God would continue to protect the preaching of His Word, that there are pastors now that... That they're preaching culturally relevant sermons. Now, I believe in, in preaching to people where they are culturally... The best advice I ever received as a pastor among all of them was like, in your library, keep two types of books. Read what your people are reading so you'll know what to preach to their heart. But then keep like the commentaries of old so you won't misalign yourself with what's being taught in the Word of God. And then he said this, if you ever find yourself preaching something that's not in the Word of God, you know you're wrong. And I know there are a lot of people right now that things sound good at first, but when it comes out, like it's, it's, it's disillusioning to people. Like it's so close to the truth. There's touches of the truth, but the truth is not there. And folks, I'm telling you, we have to pray there is a revival over the church in America right now. There, 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 it's happening. It's, it's cutting back the fog that is there. God is calling out preachers. He's calling them out to preach the truth, to speak the truth. He's calling out missionaries. He's calling out young students. He's calling out even children. Children are beginning to bring their parents to church. We're watching God do this. But unfortunately, many Christians and many churches, they're like Samson asleep in the lap of Delilah. And then all of a sudden they wake up and realize the Spirit of God is gone, but they're too far down the road to realize they've lost their strength. We don't want to be like that. When we, we need to wake up is what he's saying. You and I need to wake up. So you say, how do we wake up? And by the way, have you, have you ever had those moments where you just struggle with waking up? Like I seldom dream, but in the last month or so, there have been those times where I'll, I, I need to get up in like 30 minutes. And I'll fall into the deepest sleep 30 minutes before I get up, and I'll dream some of the weirdest dreams. And then Rain or somebody tries to wake me up, and I'm like, stop. I'm in like the spirit world. I'm like, what? 
right? Like, have you ever felt like that? Like, you're like, God, help me. Like, I just can't wake up. I, I just, I can't. That's where the church is. That's where so many Christians are right now. And through the years, we've had some wake-up calls. We've, we've had like your 9-11s. We've had your COVIDs. We've had all those things that have tried to bring the church back to Christ. And we're seeing some of that happening. But the call is clear. You say, well, how do we wake up? You don't wake up just by waking up. You wake up by getting up. Like, get up. Get up into prayer. Get up into the Word. Get up into serving. You don't just wake up by laying there. Charles Stanley used to say this. Don't start your morning devotional in the same way you woke up. Like, laying down in the bed. You'll fall back asleep. Like, get up. Just get up. If we wait until we feel like waking up, the devil will make sure you never wake up. You'll feel comfortable right where you are in your sin. You'll feel comfortable right where you are in your hypocrisy. You'll feel, right, you'll feel very comfortable right where you are. The Bible says, first of all, the call is clear in both texts. Wake up. Well, what do we do when we wake up? We have to realize once again that our, our feet are on the earthlies, but our, as a follower of Christ, we are positioned in the heavenlies. So what do we do? we got to clean up. we got to clean up. Now watch this. Go, go back to Romans 13. Here's where we're going to spend the most of our time, which is why we ended there. Go back to verse 11. I want to read this one more time because what Paul does is he lists six things but he lists them in, in three groups of two of what to clean up. And it's a reminder to all of us. He says, besides this, you know that the time has come for the hour for you to wake up from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. I love that. So again, first of all, I said it earlier. He reminds us that darkness is no longer who we are. As followers of Christ, we no longer have to continue waking up and live in the darkness and do what others do. Like you and I need to clearly see what the call of God is and clearly live that out and quit making excuses for not doing so. So he sets you up beautifully with encouragement. The night is gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off. Here it is, the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime. Here they are. Not in orgies and drunkenness. That's group one. Not in sexual immorality and sensuality. That's group two. Not in quarreling and jealousy, that's group three. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. What do we have to clean up? Well, what he's doing here is he's, he's giving you a picture. Now, you got to understand this. He's giving you a picture of someone who's been out all night carousing. And these are the things, these are the signs of the works of darkness. Now, I get it. You're going to look at some of these things. You're like, well, Pastor Ron, I like to be in bed by 8, so this text doesn't really apply to me. Like, what does this mean? Now, hang on. When we define the works of darkness, we are not just, we are not settling into an a.m. and p.m. experience. You have to get that. We are not settling into an a.m. and p.m. experience. What we're talking about here is an attitude of the heart. We're talking about spiritual warfare that is happening. It can be as light as day outside. It can be high noon, but in your heart, you're thinking evil. In your heart, your thoughts aren't captive. And that's exactly where the devil wants you, where you can clearly see physically everything around you, but your heart's not where it needs to be, but you're still walking, you're still functioning, your life's not a car wreck, if you will. It's not in total wreckness, and everything is okay. And now that you've walked that path and you're thinking those thoughts, now you tell yourself, well, this must be okay. So what does he do? Why does he tell us these things? He gives us, first of all, and in, in, in the Bible does, in these sections. He says, carousing and drunkenness. Now, what does this mean? It, you have to go back to Ephesians 5 to understand this, which is why I gave us that text. So the works of darkness and carousing and, and darkness, you're, you're not taking advantage of the time. You're literally just, you're, you're literally just roaming. You're literally just hoping and searching and grasping for something that might work, for something that might satisfy. The picture is this, of someone who goes from club to club to club to try to find satisfaction. That's literally what he's trying to say here. Someone at night who all they do is go from thing to thing, from party to party, from club to club, from event to event, from thing to thing. Nowadays, you not only don't have to do that by literally walking around. You can experience that on the Internet. You, you literally can go from chat room to porn room to, to different experience. You, you and I can experience that right there in the darkness of, our, of a little section of our house, in our room, on our phone. And you and I can carouse as long as we want. And it doesn't have to be just at night. It can be on your lunch break. 
It could even be, and once those images, once those moments are sort of embedded in your heart and your mind, you sort of become okay with them. And the Bible says the picture, again, the picture here is someone who's walking around just unsolicited, just illicit, if you will. Licentious is the the word the Bible uses, just free to try to express themselves and experience everything they can to try to find happiness. Thank God it's Friday. It's happening like every moment of every day for some people's lives. They're like, well, this didn't satisfy, so let me go try this. Here's the next one, sexual immorality and sensuality. Well, I mean, it kind of goes, there's not a whole lot we need to say about that. It's just literally moving from experience to experience physically, hoping that I find something that fills me physically. He says, you and I have to stop that. You say, well, I'm not one of those that does that. Well, we need to take check of that in our own heart. Remember, sometimes it's not just the physical act that he's talking about here. It's often the thought of. It's the images of that are in our head and in our heart. It's it's where the devil creeps in and says, you need this or you deserve this or take a look at this. And and nowadays, you don't even have to have a phone on your hand. You can just stream some uh, service or whatever. And the ads that come through, Rand and I were watching something other, sort of a free streaming service. And the commercials that were coming through, I was like, good Lord. Like, you know what I mean, right? Sometimes it's just the ads that are there in front of you. The Bible says sexuality, immorality, and sensuality. Here's the next one he lists. It's called strife and envy. Here's another way to say strife and envy. Power and want. That's what he's saying. So you're saying, well, strife and envy, when I think of that, there's not a whole lot of people that I'm angry with. And there's not a whole lot, seriously, that I want. I mean, I'm kind of content. Like, yeah, I could stand to use this or use this. This is sort of on a bucket list of mine, but it's really not. No, the Bible says it's in power and in want. In other words, it's it's this unsettledness with the things of this world. This world will never satisfy. I was listening to somebody the other day. He's not a Christian, um, but he was sort of espousing a certain religion. And and, um, he was spot on until the very end. But, I mean, he was spot on until the very end. He said, how do you raise a dead man? And I thought, oh, wait, I just just preached this. Like, what, 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 all right, let's listen. And he was sitting in a chair, and he goes, how do you raise a dead man? And I love what he said. He goes, how do you raise a dead man? He says, do you go up and whisper into their ear and say, I've got $1 billion? And he says, how do you raise a dead man? He goes, come on, just one more drink. He says, come on, just one more relationship. He says, do you whisper in their ear, the car you've always wanted is right outside. Like he just kept hitting right all of those things. And at the end, of course, he missed it. And he goes, this life is all that you have and spend it wisely because when you're done, you're done. I'm like, oh, man, like you were almost like, come on, just no, it's not. It's it's all about Jesus. I mean, you know the end of the story, but he was off. But I'm like, up to that point, he was spot on. All the possessions of this world never bring you and I enough pleasure. It's it's really never enough for just it's just enough for just a moment. And Paul here lists these six things that you and I have to clean up. We have to be on the watch for. Our our feet are in an earthly position. You and I are going to walk around and see and observe and think. We're We're going to be tempted to deviate. We're going to be tempted to shift. All of those thoughts that are out there, those actions that are out there, so quickly our job can become our idol. So quickly our retirement can become our idol. So quickly our health, whether good or bad, can become an idol. So quickly our possessions can become an idol. Relationships can become an idol. I'm telling you right now, the fog sometimes just cuts in and wants you to think that this is the right road. And then all of a sudden when the fog clears, you realize you're heading off a cliff. The path you've been on is a curve that goes off a cliff. And you're like, whoa, how did I get here? Only staying in the Word of God keeps the fog away. The Bible says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Letting me know when a curve is ahead. Letting me know when I'm about to hit a wall. Let me know when I'm heading in the wrong direction. And the Bible says, these are the six things that you and I need to look out for. But I love the way he ends this. He basically tells you and I to dress up. He tells us that. Remember, he he says back to Ephesians 5, and and even here, he tells you and I to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, he doesn't say put on the armor. He says put on the armor of light. He tells you and I how to dress. In other words, take off your pajamas. 
I know the current trend is to wear your pajamas everywhere you go, but I can't get along with that trend. <laughs> We've actually joked. We've joked many times like, let's just all as a family dress up in pajamas and go somewhere. And I'm like, oh, I, I don't know that I can do that. I'm not making fun of if you do. I mean, I know there are times that you're just like, I'm just feeling so sick. I don't feel like getting. I mean, I know that, but you know what I'm joking about. Literally, he tells you and I like, take off the old clothes, in other words. That's literally what he says. Now, let me add to this. When he tells you and I to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, it's so practical. It's so practical. You and I, we, we go into Ephesians 6 and we do a study of the armor of God and, and all the items and what do they mean. But this is so practical. It's, it's, it's daily living. Here it is. You literally pray, God, clothe me for today's activities. That's literally what he says there. When it says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, cover me with your grace. So I can discern what is out in front of me and around me that might want to stick to me. Help me with today. Live for today's events. So I know often we get dressed up for armor. And yes, the battle is, uh, is always upon us. But we may not know when the battle is there. We may not know when the enemy is going to fight here or fight there. That's why we're dressed, right? We're walking around. Because we don't know when those fiery darts are going to come at us. So when they do come at us, we know we're protected but this is so much easier than that. It's so much more simple than that. It's literally saying, God, protect me. God, help me for daily living. Like, I want to be clothed in you. I want to be covered. I don't want to put on my old clothes. I don't want to put on my grave clothes. I want to be wearing my grace clothes. I want to be fully covered in you. Here's what, I'm, here's what he means by that. What does it mean to put on Jesus? It means to put him on for direction. Because he is the Lord of your life. That's literally what it means. Put him on for direction. Like, God, here's what my calendar says, but I want your will to be done in all of this. Like, I know today I have to accomplish this and I have to accomplish that. Like, some of our schedules are rigid. Being a school teacher, uh, right? And working in, 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 in some uh, type of a trade where you're like, I've got to finish this job and finish this job and finish this job. Or whether you're traveling, you're like, I've got to arrive on this destination to make my connection at this destination. Our schedules are rigid. And we, we just can't go into sometimes our boss and our calendar and say, look, I'm giving my calendar to the grace of God. Whatever. Like they'll be like, that's, that's awesome. But no, you still got to meet with clients. No, you still got a classroom full of kids. No, you still got to go repair some plumbing. Like, I would get that, right? Remember, our feet are in, on the earthlies, but we're positioned heavenly. So what do we do with our daily calendar? Lord, my calendar is what it is. And I pray today you would give me the grace to do what you want done. And wherever my calendar takes me, I pray your will be done, that you would protect me in it, that you would bless me in it. And in all of those things, I pray, God, that you would allow me to see your hand in all of this. That's what I pray. You say, well, Pastor Ron, you're in the church. Doing the church calendar is kind of easy. <laughs> okay. Right? I mean, you're right. I mean, I get it. Like, but I pray like, Lord, I don't know who's on my calendar for next week. I don't know what, what I'm about to encounter, who, who I'm about to meet with, like what situation. I don't even know what sermon you want done next. Like all that. I'm like, I'm just going to show up and I'm going to submit myself to you. And wherever you take me, Lord, then I want to follow you. That's what you and I pray. Pray for direction. Pray for him for deliverance. You, just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you don't ever need to be delivered again. God, deliver me from these thoughts. Deliver me from these intentions. Deliver me from my attitude. Deliver me from my desires. Deliver me from my wants, right? Jesus even prayed, not my will be done, but your will be done. It's the same thing. And put him on for dominion because he's king and Messiah. How quickly can you and I think that we're the ones in charge? How quickly do you and I think we're in charge of our paycheck? We're in charge of our income. We're in charge of our destiny. We are the captain of our... How often can we fall into those cultural terms? No, I'm not. I'm absolutely not in charge. I, I say this all the time. I am the glove and God is the hand. And God, when you put your hand in my, in, into that, my life, the glove, then that's when the glove makes sense. Without you, the glove is meaningless. And so, Father, I pray right now you take over my life. Here's what we do is, as we go out into the world... When we put on the Lord Jesus Christ, what does it mean to go out into the world? It means put on Jesus over your sorrows and around your tears. You see it right there. You're, you're, listen, we live in a fallen world. And in a fallen world, there are fallen people. In a fallen world with fallen people, fallen things happen. 
Like you and I are going to encounter sorrows. We're going to encounter tears. You put Jesus over that. We live in a fallen world. I try my best to cover that in previous sermons where we try, to, we try to change it through education. We try to change it through environment. We try to change it through legislation. And there's nothing wrong with those things. But those things won't ever save us. Ever. But there's nothing wrong with education. The Bible tells us that Deuteronomy 6, how to educate. That there's nothing wrong with environment. The Bible put you in charge over this environment. I mean, we ought to be the, the Christians ought to be the ones celebrating World Day every day, not just a day on the calendar. God put us in charge of this world, right? Legislation. We need Christians in politics, absolutely in legislation. Absolutely. But those things won't save us. But the Bible tells you and I, we live in a fallen world with fallen people, and fallen things will happen. And that means I'm gonna get hurt. That means because I live in a fallen world, I'm going to be prone to sickness. I'm going to be prone to aches. I'm going to be prone to hurts and tears. Put Jesus on over that. Put Jesus over your aches and pains. Put Jesus over your failures and your shame. Because if you don't, the devil will come in and he'll take that tear and he'll say, cry more because your God didn't show up. If you don't, what if the devil will come in in that moment and he'll tell you, if your God is a God of, of healing, then why are you in so much pain? And you go, absolutely. If God really is a God that protects your heart, then why do all these things keep attacking your heart? Yeah, what's up with that? If you don't put Christ over your failures and shame, the devil will just come right in and constantly remind you of who you were before Christ. When you put on the Lord Jesus Christ, you put him on first before you ever put on the armor. In other words, don't hang on to your old clothes. Get rid of them. Take them to God's goodwill, right? Make no provision for the flesh is what he says. Get rid of those old clothes. Like for some of us, we, we call it addiction. We call it anxiety. But we hang up anxiety in the closet and we feel like we want to be anxious. We go back and grab it. We call it addiction, but the last time I went through it, it kind of helped me out. So we never really get rid of it, like an old shirt that we don't get rid of. Like, don't raise your hand. How many of you have an old pair of shorts, an old, you got that old shirt that you've had since 1984. I don't know how old you are, right? You've had since 19. I just can't get rid of that. I was in seventh grade when I wore them shorts, and I can still wear them now. Wow. Well, whatever. Anyway, right? They're still there. They got moth, ho moth holes in them. But man, you're hanging on to that. Get rid of them. And right now, some wife is saying, thank God I'm going to go home and throw away all my husband's stuff. That's not what I meant. Or some husband's going to go home and say, honey, you have three closets in the house. Pastor Ron said, clean them out. That's not what I meant. Maybe, but not. You have to pray over that. But you know what I'm saying here? If you and I keep hanging on to those old grave clothes, the devil will continue to remind you of who you used to be. And honestly, sometimes putting on those old clothes does feel good. The memories flood. It's soft, right? Every bit of that. The Bible says you got to get rid of them. Get rid of them. Remember, wake up, clean up, dress up. Charles Spurgeon said this, and I love it. In Christ Jesus, there is merit to cover our demerit. There is purity to cover our impurity. Obedience to cover our disobedience. Beauty to cover our deformity. And perfection to cover our imperfections. No wonder he was the prince of preachers. Here it is. Life is too short. And eternity is too long. Eternity is real. And life is valuable. The truth is too wonderful for you to sleep through it all. And soon Christ is coming. Can I remind you of this? Can I remind you of this? Let's be reminded of this. You and all, everybody in here were sentenced to death. And the moment you were born is when it commenced. But God. 1 Corinthians 15. But God. Everybody in here was sentenced to death because of sin. Because of this fallen world. But God. All of our striving, all of our achieving, all of our attempts at trying to live are worthless. They're worthless. But God. I have to end with this. Come to Christ. And for some, maybe come back to Christ. But I want to be clear about this. When the, when the Bible says come to Christ, what does it mean? It means to repent or turn away from 
your sins and turn to Jesus. Ask Him to forgive you of your sins and acknowledge Him as Lord of your life. Listen to the Bible, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us, you're going to come short. Even this religious philosopher that was waxing religious on Instagram was almost there. How do you wake up a dead man? One billion dollars, come out. Just one more drink, come out. The car of your dreams is right there, come on out. And he goes, that's not it. All you've been given is one life. Live it well. And I thought, no. Like there's a comma where you're at, but it's, but God. But God knew that. And God stepped in to rescue you from a life separated from him. No matter what you try to do outside of Christ, you will fall short. Come to Christ. Romans 10 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Have you made that confession? Romans 10, 13, for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Call on him. It's just that simple. Call on him. You don't have to become somebody. You don't have to do anything. Christianity is spelled done, D-O-N-E, on the cross when Jesus Christ said it is finished. It is done. Like, it's done. All you need to proverbially do is call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, my life is in a fog, surrounded by sin in a world of darkness. I am separated from you. God, save me. Acts 16, 31, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. I love that. In John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Now, I love that word mankind because it means, yes, globally, but it means you personally. It means you personally. For God so loved you, insert your name. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but will have everlasting life. How do you wake up a dead man? But God. How do you wake up a dead man? But God. Call on Christ. And for those of you that are Christians, you better wake up every morning and say, God, it may be a.m. outside, but it's p.m. for the rest of the world. It may be a.m. The sun is up, but it's still a world of darkness. And God, I don't want to be disillusioned by this augmented reality So, Father, I put you on this morning. Come to Christ. I put you on this morning, and I'm asking you to guide my decisions. I'm asking you to protect my heart. I'm asking you to light my path because everything that this world wants to throw at me is going to be nothing but a fog that wants to deviate me from you, and I don't want that. So, Father, this morning, as though I walk with my my feet in the earthly position, I am seated with you in the heavenlies. Guide me with that thought. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in. We've been saying that now. What is this? Sermon 10, 11, 11. We've been saying that 11 Sundays now. God, let it be done. Let it be done. As you come to him to ask it to be done. Amen. Amen.